Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome in to uh, another session of our Bible study on the Acts of the Apostles. Today is our, I believe, our fourth gathering. Uh, we have we did an introduction, and then we've been covering one chapter a week. My goal today is to get through two chapters. Chapter three is pretty short, so I'm hoping we can buzz through chapters three and four. Basically, where we left off last week was the uh, narration of Pentecost the descent of the Holy Spirit on the disciples. And then, of course, there's a crowd gathering outside, wondering what is taking place. St. Peter gets up and gives a homily. It cuts them to the heart, and 3,000 people are baptized into discipleship to Christ. So that's where we left off last time. And now we're going to see the next thing that takes place. Uh, following that event, which will be continually testifying to who Christ is, who Jesus is as the Christ, as the Messiah. And um, again, showing through signs and wonders that the testimony that they're giving is, is true and valid. So if there are no questions, we will jump right into the text of chapter three. Okay, great. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. So basically, Saints Peter and John are walking to the temple to pray. And there's a, a man there who is, uh, does not have use of his legs from the time of his birth. So it's a birth defect. And every day his friends bring him and lay him at the gate of the temple, which is called the beautiful gate. Uh, and basically this man is there asking for alms and he asks for alms from Peter and John as well. And so now the ancient Jews prayed uh, at fixed times throughout the day. So there was the first hour which was at 6 a.m., third hour, which was, is 9 a.m., sixth hour is 12 p.m., ninth hour is 3 p.m. So the ninth hour is where we're at now. So this is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and this is the time of the evening sacrifices when the Jews would come to the temple, to the inner courts of the temple, to pray while the priests offered the daily sacrifices as commanded by God way back in the book of Exodus. So Notice, though, that the disciples, even though they've received the Holy Spirit, even though they are disciples of Christ, they have, are engaged continually in the already established Jewish liturgical, um, uh, Jewish liturgical celebrations. They don't see themselves as something separate from Judaism, and they are continuing in the religious practices that they, that they know. So at nine, at three o'clock in the afternoon, at the third, at the ninth hour, they go to the temple uh, to pray. Now, interestingly, this same structure of prayer uh, of the hours, so first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, is carried over into the life of the church. We don't see it too often in parishes. Um, the only time really we see the hours used. I mean, I can't say that it's not used anywhere, but uh, at least in most parishes are, are around the major feasts. So like we have on Holy Friday, we do the royal hours, which have the same structure of first, third, sixth, ninth. Uh, and then we have like before Christmas and before Epiphany, they're also the celebration of the royal hours. Um, but really throughout the day, uh, these prayers, you can find these prayers, actually, you can find them in, in prayer books or even online, can be offered by Orthodox Christians, there's Orthodox prayers of the hours as well. And these are mostly maintained um, on a daily basis at, in the monastic settings. And some faithful people who will practice them in their private prayer as well. Now the gate, which was called beautiful, that's uh, St. Luke where counts here, was one of the gates of the temple that was um, very richly adorned with Corinthian bronze. And so it was very beautiful. And so that's how it got that name. Um, interestingly, the gate leading into the altar 
in the Orthodox churches. So like the main central gate that the priest uses, the priests and deacons and bishops use, use to get in and out of the altar uh, is called the Oreapili, which means the beautiful gate as well. So there's a connection there to our liturgical uh, setup in our, our church uh, our church art. And that brings us now to verse four. And fixing his eyes on him with John, with John, Peter said, look at us. So Peter's the one fixing his eyes. So Peter now kind of just staring at this guy and he says, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So St. Peter here commands the man to be healed. Uh, the man who was born lame, uh, he commands in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that he will be healed. So to pray in the name of Jesus means that we pray according to his will, that we desire for and that we pray for the things that he also wants. The way we can think of it is like if somebody is representing a king or, you know, a very high official, we can only say that they're truly representing if they are in agreement or truly expressing what the actual wishes of the person uh, is, you know, what, what they are. So for Peter not to say in the name of Jesus Christ is to say that this is the will of Jesus for you to be healed. So he's representing, he's kind of standing as a, as a medium between Jesus and this, uh, this man. Now in the Old Testament, to pray in the name of God or the name of God itself was very, uh, was indicative of his very presence. So to invoke the name of God or to, you know, to say, you know, to refer to the name of God was to refer to God himself, was to refer to his presence. So, for example, the temple was the place where God would put his name. And of course, we know that the temple was the place where God came to be present among his people. So when we see the name, it's not just the name of you're not just calling on the name like it's some magic spell. You're, you know, it's you're the very presence of God is there to bring about, you know, in this case, the healing of this uh, the man born lame. Uh, the fact that Jesus's name could produce such a miracle is indicative that he himself is God, right? Like that's to say that we're going to heal in the name of Jesus Christ is to say that Jesus is God. Um, and that by calling on his name, the disciples could perform these signs and wonders. So that's, that's important. St. Peter not only is going to heal the man, He's also preaching to him, right? He's saying in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and to use the term Christ, Christ is not Jesus's last name. It's a title meaning Messiah. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's to say Jesus is the Messiah and he's God. That's what, that's what the implication are of St. Peter's statement there. And he took him by the right hand, we're in verse seven now, and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it, that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So Peter heals the man. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And then the man enters with them into the temple to praise God. Again, the implication here is that the man is going to praise the one who actually healed him, which, who is Jesus, who is God, right? You're going into the temple to praise God, but you're also praising Jesus who just healed him. So the, the idea of Jesus being God are you know, intertwined, you know, those two, you know, uh, ideas of Jesus, the Messiah and the God are in being intertwined here. Uh, and especially if you're in the person of this uh, man born lame. The apostles are not just preachers, but they're called uh, also to, to do perform signs and wonders to, to work healings, to bring the grace and mercy of God to the people, you know, to, to, to make an impact uh, and to be God's hands and feet in the community, even though he himself is not, you know, physically manifested there. Now, this, it, it, the same thing takes place again in the church, right? So in the Orthodox church, we as a community 
led by the clergy, but certainly with the people as well. We pray special prayer services all the time for those who are sick, whether it's a paraclesis service, a service of supplication to the Virgin Mary, to Christ, to the saints, uh, or whether it's the sacrament of healing, which is holy unction. Um, we offer these prayers in the name of Christ uh, for the healing and salvation of, of the person that we're praying for, that the sick may be healed by God through the prayers of the church. We also have, of course, many saints in the life of the church who are known for their healing intercessions. You know, even into this modern day, we have many, you know, saints and, and new saints, you know, that are being canonized um, that were known for their for their healing prayers, their healing intercessions. Of course, one of the big modern day ones that we know is Saint Nectarios. Saint Nectarios is known for helping people with cancer. We also have like saints like Saint Luke, the surgeon of Crimea, who helped many people during his life because he was a doctor, especially with eye problems, but really he can be called on for any type of, of, of sickness. I mean, I've heard a wonderful miracle healing stories with St. Marina and, and all different, of all different saints. So the saints especially are very active um, when it comes to people being sick and taking part in their, in their healing process as well, whether that be through modern medicine or whether that be through the grace of God through a miraculous healing, which do take place even, even today. All right, verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So Father Lawrence Farley, he has a note in his commentary that Solomon's porch was often used for discussions and teachings by the Pharisees especially after the feasts, the major feasts. So this is theoretically where the child Jesus would have been contending with the Pharisees and asking them questions. When as a young man, when as a boy, he stayed behind. Uh, if you're familiar with that story, uh, his family had, you know, the Virgin Mary, Joseph and Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the Passover. Joseph and Mary go on with their party back towards their home. And Jesus stays behind, unknown to them. You know, they, they have no idea. And for three, you know, basically he's in Jerusalem for like two or three days by himself. And where do they find him? They find him in the temple uh, asking, the, uh, asking the Pharisees questions and, and answering their questions. So this is theoretically where that could have been taking place. And this also is theoretically where Jesus would have been confronted by the Pharisees after the Feast of Dedication, which we uh, studied in the Gospel of John. So this is not a, a new location, so to speak, for Christian and, and Jewish conf confrontation and contention. Um, and so that's where they're at. And this is where now uh, there's a crowd gathering because everybody has seen that this man who was lame now can, now can walk. And he's not only was he walking, he's jumping around and praising God. And St. Peter will use this as an opportunity to now to preach, just like he did with, in, in Pentecost. He's going to do the same thing now. So now that brings us to verse 12. So when Peter saw it, meaning the crowd, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all. So Peter is now, this is his second homily recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, uses this miracle, this very blatant and apparent miracle, as an opportunity to again proclaim who Jesus really is, which first and foremost is that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, and that it's, he starts out by saying that it's not by our own power, right, it's not Peter and John that are heal, healing this man by their by their own power or their own righteousness, right, that they're so holy that they bring on, you know, this saving power from God, 
but the man was healed through Jesus Christ, that Jesus was the one who healed the man through them. In other words, um, the miracle that you have seen now and you're gathering to, you know, uh, be awestruck by was done not by us, but by Jesus. And that goes back to that very beginning of this book where uh, St. Luke uh, is dedicating his book to Theophilus and he's talking about how in the first volume, you know, I, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, we, we began to tell the things that Jesus began to do and to pre and to speak, right? Began to say and to do. So now it's still Jesus doing the acting. It's just through his disciples who act as like a conduit. They're acting like a, like a wire passing the grace, you know, through them into, uh, into this man to bring about his healing. And he uses, again, he uses this miracle to show that he's truly the Messiah. He refers, he refers in this passage to um, the, Jesus being the servant, right? This, the, uh, let me get the exact uh, wording here. Uh, glorified his servant, Jesus. So that, that reference to the servant, there is a reference to the, the book of the prophecy of Isaiah where Isaiah talks about the suffering servant uh, who is the Messiah, you know, and how the Messiah is de you know, destined to, to suffer uh, on behalf of the people, but that his suffering will bring about, you know, salvation. So Peter even uses languages from the prophets, you know, to, to further drive his, his point home there. You know, the Holy One of God, the Prince of Life, he's listing all his different titles. Uh, he also you know, uses uh, this opportunity to remind them that this same Jesus was the one that they crucified, just like he did in chapter two. Remember with chapter two, he did the same thing at Pentecost. You know, he's saying, you no, know, Jesus ascended and sent down the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, by the way, is the one you crucified and, you know, get, delivered him up and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But Peter again says here that he rose from the dead, which we are witnesses of. So it's not like they're making something up. It's not, they're not, you know, uh, delivering some you know, kind of uh, cooked up a story. This is something that they themselves have seen and heard, and they are sharing their experiences now with another group of people. He even brings up that, you know, they chose a murderer instead of Christ. When Pilate, Pilate was ready to let him go, and yet, they chose to have Barabbas, right? If we're familiar with the Passion narrative, they chose to have Barabbas instead of Jesus. And in the Old Testament, uh, an unjust judge, a judge who absolves criminals and punishes the righteous, would bring a curse on himself and be subject to God's judgment. And so now St. Peter, again, is, is trying to awaken their conscience by saying, okay, if, if an unjust judge brings God's judgment down on his head. How about you who condemned Jesus, the Holy One of God, the Messiah of Israel, and chose instead the murderous Barabbas to be freed? Um, so basically, he's telling them that, you know, right now they're on the wrong side of judgment. You know, they're on the wrong, they're on the wrong team, so to speak. But we'll see here that he's going to give them the road forward to he doesn't do it just to crush them, but again, to awaken their conscience and bring them to repentance. So that brings us now to verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So there's that suffering Messiah reference again from Isaiah. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven and earth must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his pro holy prophets since the world began. So just like in chapter two at Pentecost, St. Peter here calls the people to repent. And so in the English, it says, repent and be converted, um, which would bring about the forgiveness of their sins. 
uh, of which he admits himself that they were ignorant, right? Like they, I knew you, I know that you didn't know what you were doing, right? Even Jesus on the cross says, says as much, right? For, for, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So uh, the people are ignorant of what they've done, but now Peter has told them what they've done. So he's, so now they can't be, so now they will be held responsible if they're not willing to repent. Um, Father Stephen DeYoung makes the point that, that that line where it says, repent therefore and be converted. Be converted is better probably understood as be changed. So St. Peter is telling them uh, to repent, which means to change. So change and be changed. So there's some nuance there, right? Like change, initiate the change yourself, but also be changed. Allow God to transform you. Allow God to change you. And that's very much in line with our own orthodox understanding of what repentance is, right? Like we have to, like in the parable of the prodigal son, the son comes to his senses when he's dying, you know, starved, dying of starvation out in faraway lands. He comes to his senses. He has to change first, right? And so he changes his way, comes back home, but it's the father in the end who restores him. So St. Peter is saying not only change to make good choices, but Allow God to do his part as well. Allow God to change you into what he calls, you know, what he wants you to be. So St. Peter here is telling them that, well, even though you've done this horrible thing, even though you've killed the Messiah, you know, and he, again, he, he doesn't spare any uh, sympathies for them. He says here that, you know, it's not hopeless, you know, that, but, that, but, but that they need to change, you know, they, they need to change and repent so that when Christ returns, you know, he says Christ for now is up in heaven, but he's going to return at the restoration of all things. And when he does, you know, you need to be ready to receive him. You need to be prepared. You need to have changed and repented so that when he comes, you'll find it a refreshment, you know, a, a, a relief from God's judgment so that when, when he comes, you'll, you won't have to bear the burden of God's judgment at that time. So that's a message for us too, right? As even as Orthodox Christians, as, as disciples of Christ in the world, uh, I'm myself a, very much a struggling disciple, um, a pilgrim. Uh, you know, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to repent. We have to change and be changed as well. And we do that as Christians through our baptisms course which is a one-time deal but also through our 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 living according to the commandments of god by exhibiting love and mercy and forgiveness and self-sacrifice towards god and and our neighbors and especially too by our participation in the sacraments of the church so that means of course uh, holy communion holy confession you know those are the two kind of that we do again and again and again along with holy unction um, but you know, the, the, the confession and, and Holy communion, those are the ones that are to be done, you know, regularly, very regularly, um, in order to, again, refresh us, you know, to cut away the things that are dead, to allow room for new virtue to spring forth and to be refreshed in that way through Christ. Okay. Verse 22, we're going to finish chapter three here and move to chapter four. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So that's a quote. He's quoting Moses there. So whoever does not receive the prophet will be destroyed. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these things. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant, Jesus, there's that servant again, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So uh, St. Peter, again, appeals now here to their Jewish background and their knowledge of the scriptures to make the point here that. Moses said that whoever rejects the prophet, you know, will be destroyed from among the people. And yet all these prophets came and they were preaching the same thing. So obviously they weren't talking about themselves. They were waiting for somebody to come 
to be the prophet. And whoever rejects that prophet will be destroyed from among the people, according to Moses, right? So now he's talking, you know, St. Peter's making the point that they're talking about Jesus, who is the Messiah. Um, so again, he's, he's using this imagery of, you know, Jesus coming as, the, as a judge, Jesus coming one day to judge the, judge the world. Uh, and, and he's appealing to that, saying that, you know, you guys need to get on the right side of, of God's judgment, because right now you've, you have rejected in the past, you did reject the prophet, you know, you, you did exactly what Moses told you not to do. So what are you going to do now? You know, what, what's, what are you going to do? Are you going to repent? Or are you going to stay in your sin and be destroyed? Essentially is what he's warning. Them. It's what he's telling them. Um, you know, this, this passage too, I think it's important for us to think about as Christians, because many times we have a very difficult time turning away from our own sins, right? We have a difficult time repenting of our sins. It's very much easier to just justify ourselves or say, well, appeal to God's mercy, you know, and we'll be fine, which is, we should appeal to God's mercy too, but we also have to act and repent. A lot of times it's because we're afraid that it will be too difficult to let go of that sinful past, or we don't see the sins that we're committing as harmful, or that we won't be able to do it, you know, we won't be able to let go of it, we're afraid. But here St. Peter explains and encourages the people to repent, saying that repenting brings on God's blessings and it makes the burden of life easier to bear. That when we repent, we actually move from the shadow of life, from like a, a shadowy version of human life to actual real human life. That only when we repent can we actually become true human beings. Only when we become Christ-like can we become true human beings. Uh, there's a really nice uh, documentary called Becoming Truly Human that focuses on that theme. If you haven't seen it yet, you should watch it. It's very good. <clears throat> All right. That brings us now to chapter four, verse one. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So St. Peter and St. John are now arrested by the Sanhedrin, you know, the, temp the, the priests, the Pharisees, the captain of the temple, which would have been the temple guard, and the Sadducees, which were like the temple rulers. Um, and they're arrested. Because they're preaching, first of all, because they're preaching, they're not Pharisees, they have no authority to preach, but also because they're preaching Jesus as the Messiah, which was a no-no, and they're preaching the resurrection from the dead. Um, this would have been especially troubling to the Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. For them, that was a heresy. So it's kind of like a trifecta of, uh, <laughs> a trifecta of uh, infractions there. So they get, they get arrested and they spend the night in you know, temple prison. It's interesting, though, to think that even though the church here is being persecuted, my right, first time uh, since Christ's own crucifixion, and now one of his disciples is being persecuted. But even so, more and more people are believing, right? They're accepting, they're hearing the word, and they're accepting it. And it says that here, you know, the number became 5,000. So that means that, you know, since Pentecost, another 2,000 people have become disciples of Christ. So. This is one of the marks of the true church, right? The true and authentic church, that the followers of Christ will t give testimony to the truth of the gospel through their sufferings, you know, through their own persecutions. They give witness to the power of the gospel in their lives. So we have as examples, of course, the apostles who themselves suffered. They all were martyred except for St. John the Evangelist. We have many, 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 many thousands and thousands of martyred saints who spilled their blood. Uh, and we say many times that the church was really built on the blood of the martyrs. In fact, in the early, in the ancient church, when the, they were, you know, doing, you know, eating the Eucharist and catacombs and things like that, 
they would perform the, the, the liturgy, they would perform the Eucharist on the tombs of martyrs. Uh, and even when they started building churches, when it was legal then, and they began to build churches, they would take relics of martyrs and place them on, uh, in, in the cloth, on the mincion, which is the cloth that goes on the altar table. They, would, they also then began placing the, the relics of the martyrs in the altar table. So even like in our modern day churches, we have relics of martyrs in the altar table, right? And that's going back to the beginning. So these men and women who died and gave their life for Christ are basically saying, they're making, they're with their own blood, they're making the point that there is no price that it's, that it's not worth it to them to pay, right? There's no price they won't pay to give testimony to what God has done for them. There's nothing that will stop them from, from proclaiming Christ and from following Christ in their lives. And that gives witness to others, right? I think that's the greatest testimony. That's the greatest proof of what the gospel, that, of that the gospel is true, is that the people who were closest to Jesus Christ, his own disciples, his own best friends, went out and gave their lives to tell people what they saw and what they heard, right? If, if they didn't see the miracles, and if they didn't hear the preaching, and if they didn't hear, if they didn't see him raised from the dead, would they have gone out and bowed their necks to the swords to die on behalf of Jesus? I don't think so. I certainly would not, right? It, the, it, if that was the case, the, the Christian movement would have died out like all the other movements in, you know, Judea, Roman Judea. It would have died out. And yet here we have the church being persecuted and more and more people are believing and being added to the church. So as, as, as Christians born out of this tradition of martyrdom, uh, we also should be ready to give testimony, knowing that we too uh, may suffer for it. And that's okay. It's good. We, that's, that's how we show people that it's important in our life. All right. Verse five, before I start soapboxing. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Anas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So they bring this big delegation. And these are not just like, you know, the B-listers. These are the, these are the this is the highest level of temple authority. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big, these are the big shots. You know, Annas and Caiaphas are involved in Jesus's own trial. You know, so it's, the, you know, they're the high priests. And basically you get the sense that they're trying to int intimidate Peter and John, Saints Peter and John. And we'll see that that's kind of the route that they go as we get later on in their, in their trial. So they basically say, what gives you the right to go and say these things, you know? Um, especially, of course, knowing that on the night of Jesus' arrest, all the disciples fled, minus St. John the Evangelist. Maybe they were expecting, you know, somebody proclaiming Jesus to get scared and to kind of back down. We'll see, although, that that is definitely not what happens. So, verse 8, here we have Peter again is going to, Peter's going to take up the, the mantle of spokesman. So this is verse eight. Then Peter filled with the Holy spirit said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So St. Peter knows very well <laughs> how Annas and Caiaphas and all these people feel about the name of Jesus Christ. And yet when asked by what name are you doing these things, he has no problem not only telling them that it's through Jesus, but he also reminds them, oh, by the way, he's, he was the one that you crucified that God raised from the dead, you know, by the way. 
if you forgot, you know, two months ago, this is what happened. So we see here how the Holy Spirit emboldens the faithful to preach and live righteously, even when opposed and threatened. When the heart is humble and when the heart is willing to have, you know, and desirous to, to, to please God, then the Holy Spirit, you know, can take its place and, and give us strength. Remember that at, the, at Jesus's trial, St. Peter was being questioned by one of the Praetorium servant girls. Remember that he's warming his hands. Oh, aren't you one of Jesus's followers? And Peter, you know, cowers. He's, he denies Christ three times. Now, however, St. Peter is openly proclaiming Jesus to the very faces of the high priests and their, and their entourage. I'll, I'll, point to, I'll point us all now to Luke chapter 12, the gospel according to Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. This is now the words of Christ himself. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So here we see the words of Jesus being fulfilled, that he, they, they're brought in front of the you know, they're brought in front of the leaders of the Jewish people, and Peter, you know, Peter has the words you know, to respond to them. Not only does St. Peter proclaim Jesus, but he also makes it clear that basically they have put, pitted themselves against God. You know? <laughs> that they have, that they have uh, you know, lined up on the opposite side of the line, the battlefield line, against God himself. And they quote Psalm 118. He quotes Psalm 118, the stone that was rejected has become the chief of the corner. That's from the Psalms. And uh, he quotes it there as Jesus did in his own preaching as well. It's basically saying like, oh, this guy that you saw as useless and saw as a heretic, now he's been raised from the dead and been glorified by God. And this is the, this is the means by which, this is the power by which we have healed this man, that really that Jesus has healed this man. We talked again about how the name of Je the name of Jesus is not simply the name, but the presence of God. So Christ is the only one through whom we can be saved, as Peter Saint Peter says here. Not any other Messiah that they were waiting for, you know. And the same message is for us. A lot of you know in our in our pluralistic age, where we have so many different religious uh, you know frameworks, all you know living in the same same uh, societal spheres we be, we've become very pluralistic where we say things like oh there's many paths that lead to the top of the mountain you know what's good for me it's, it might not be good for you so you know, what it's, whatever you believe is great blah 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 but here in the scriptures it says right the only name that can save you right that's what saint peter says right this is the only one this is the this is the one there's no other, so in other words, there is no other path to the top of the mountain. We may all have different paths to get to him, but he's the one that's going to lead us to salvation. There's nothing else besides him. So when they ask by whose authority and by whose name they're doing these things, St. Peter says by the only real authority, right? Which is God, which is Jesus. There's only one authority to do these kinds of things. Now that brings us to verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. So they kind of figured out that these, oh, these are his disciples. And they're like, you know, wow, this, we were not expecting that. You know, we were, not, we were not waiting for that response. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it, right? They couldn't deny the miracle. Because the man that they themselves had seen every day outside the temple now was literally standing, right? Not sitting. He's standing right next to them. The man was lame from his birth. So they can't deny the miracle either. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they put Peter and John and the man outside and they huddle up to decide what they're going to do. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So 
the apostles here, they might be uneducated and untrained theologically compared to the Pharisees, but the Holy Spirit provides what is lacking, especially in those who humbly serve him. Uh, in, the, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 1, we read, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And that righteousness comes from God. It's interesting, too, here that this, this, this council or whatever, the elders here, they admit that a great miracle has been done in the name of Jesus. And yet, instead of, you know, taking into consideration that maybe they were wrong, you know, instead of being, you know, repent and be baptized like, like the other 5,000 that have done so already, they're more worried about the image of being wrong, right? They're more worried about uh, Christianity, you know, discipleship to Jesus being a threat to the power that they had, because these were powerful men. These were the most powerful men of their time. Um, and to be losing disciples, to be losing people from you know, basically being dependent on them as the leaders of the temple life to being disciples of Jesus was not great. That would not be great for them. And so they're trying to basically stop the story from, instead of, you know, repenting and proclaiming the story and saying, oh, God has come again amongst us and repenting and being baptized, they try to, to basically to cover it up by threatening Peter and John and saying, you know, that's what they've decided they're going to do. They're going to threaten them to get them to stop talking. So they're not even, they don't even reject, they're not even rejecting Peter and John at this point because of any religious argument. It's literally just because their threat, their power structure is threat. It shows how hard their hearts are, which we saw, which we saw in the passion narrative, right? Like when we studied the gospel of John, we saw that, you know, we saw how hard their hearts were. And here it shows that nothing really has changed. Verse 18, so they called them, so now they bring them back in, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So they use this council's role as the judges, right? They say, okay, you guys are the judges. So tell us, is it, who should we listen to, you or to God? Right? They, they, they turn the tables on them and, and use their own authority against them. Who's, who's the one we should listen to? You as the high priest or to God himself? Right? And of course, it's a rhetorical question because of course the answer is going to be to always to listen to God. And they're basically saying, this is what God has told us to do. This is what God, this is what we have seen from him. This is what we have heard from him. And this is literally what he commanded us to do. So basically they say, no, we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop preaching. We're not going to stop preaching Christ resurrected from the dead. So it shows there that obedience to God comes first. A lot of times we don't have conflict between obedience to God and obedience to authority, but sometimes it does. And it sure feels like it's going to keep happening more frequently. I can't, I don't know if that's true, but many times there are times where there, there may be more frequent times when God's authority and other authority kind of come into conflict. St. Peter and St. John here show us that it's always God, God's voice that we have to listen to first, no matter what the consequences may be. And they are doing this um, so that they can share their testimony, so that they can share their witness, which is hugely important in the life of the church, even in the modern day church. You know, one of the most powerful ways that we can share the gospel is again by by sharing our own stories you know each of us have a story of faith you know those especially those who have advanced in their spiritual life those who have come to faith from other stages of their lives they have powerful stories of transformation they have powerful stories of healing 
they have powerful stories of life, you know, when there's darkness and despair and death, you know, there's, there's so much light and peace and joy. And those stories need to be told. I mean, those stories need to be shared. Uh, St. Peter and St. John and all the disciples are going to do that in their life. They're going to go and tell people what they've seen and heard. And we as Christians in our own life have to go and tell people what we've seen, the things that we've experienced in our own life. Not just looking at, not to, not to praise ourselves, not to you know, prop up ourselves and say, oh, look at us, look how special we are. But to, to point people to the reality of God's, of who God is, you know, to proclaim Christ, proclaim Jesus as the Christ, as the Savior, as God. That testimony is hugely important. And it's one, it's actually one of the focal points as we kind of move our youth ministry programs at our parish forward into you know, a more uh, I don't know, maybe that's not the right way to say it, but as we kind of reevaluate and try to make more effective ministries in our own parish, this is one of the things that we're going to be trying to incorporate more is, you know, people who have powerful stories to share them with our youth, you know, um, to share them, to share those stories with young people, because those are stories that can em embolden them in their own lives to follow Christ, even when it's difficult. So if you have good story, you know, if you have a, a, a meaningful story and all of, the, all of our stories are meaningful to God, but you shouldn't be afraid to, to talk about it. You know, it may not be the most comfortable thing in the world, but you know, those, those stories are important. Your story is important. Uh, the Saint, uh, Saint Luke here includes the detail that the man was for over 40 years old when the miracle had taken place to show the impossibility of the miracle, right? That such a long time had passed for this man to be healed. And then all of a sudden at 40 years of age, he was healed. I also, it, when I was preparing for this came to mind that, you know, Jesus heals a man who was 38 years paralyzed, not from his mother's womb, but 38 years paralyzed by the pool of Siloam. And here they have a man healed 40, who's born lame from 40 years old. And in our introduction, if you remember, I read a quote from, um, uh, Bishop Augustinos of Blessed Memory from Greece, who said, don't be surprised that when you read the book of Acts, the disciples actually do miracles that are more, that are even greater than Jesus's miracles. So this is one of those cases. They beat him by, they beat him by two years there. Of course, it's Jesus who's doing the miracle, so it's not a competition. Uh, verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they, had, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people's plot, people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against this Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now look, Lord, on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So this is the prayer of the church. They all pray with one accord here. And the, the prayer begins. Um, the prayer begins by kind of referring back to the uh, Psalm 2, saying, oh, why do the people rage? Or why do the heathens rage and the peoples meditate empty things, you know, vain things? The kings took their stand and the rulers were gathered against the Lord and against this Christ. And then basically Peter makes the point that this, this scripture is fulfilled in Jesus, right? That, that the, the, the heathens, the, the, the Romans, right? And the people, the people of Israel, along with Pontius Pilate and Herod, who are the kings and the, and the rulers, all plotted together. They all worked together against to kill Christ, right? But even though they were doing all of these things, they actually were carrying out, carrying out God's will, right? So it goes to show that really who's in control, right? God, there's nothing, there's nothing that God's enemies can do to him, really, at the end of the day. Um, so... Um, basically saying, so this is the one that you have, you know, this is, this, these scriptures fulfilled in the person of Christ. And uh, <clears throat> in Christ, we preach these things and basically asking them for the boldness 
just as God overcame his enemies in the resurrection to give them boldness and strength to preach, continue preaching and healing in the name of Christ, which was the three things that they were told not to do, right? They said, don't preach and don't do anything in the name of Christ. So now they're praying to God to allow them to preach and heal in the name of Christ. So literally they're doing the opposite. They're praying for the opposite of what, of what Annas and Caiaphas and their, and their, and the posse told them to do. Uh, and we see God's response immediately in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So God responds. And the, the room, the house shakes. Again, just like Pentecost, right? The, the, the wind came and shook the house. Here the house is shaken again. So God responds, basically assuring them that, yes, I will, I will give you the strength to preach and heal. In, in the name of Jesus Christ. So even though they had already received the spirit on Pentecost, you know, in, in the church, especially in the sacraments, we experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit again and again. It's not a second Pentecost here. It's just a continual experience. It's a never ending experience of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have, for example, in the liturgy, uh, the, in the prayer of the epiclesis, usually when the people are kneeling in the church, is at the time when the bread and the wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ, the priest prays with the people. Once again, we offer to you this spiritual worship without the shedding of blood. We beseech and pray and entreat you, send down your Holy Spirit upon us. And the gifts are presented. So in all the sacraments, we pray for the Spirit to descend, right? Even in the weddings, right? We pray for the Spirit to descend and to join the man and the woman together. It's always, it's again and again and again, experiencing the descent of the Holy Spirit. Um, in our lives. Now we'll just read these last few verses here. Verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was on his, was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So they're, they're still preaching. They didn't stop. They were not, they were not intimidated by the threats of Annas and Caiaphas. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, uh, excuse me, Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Uh, so this will, be, will become very important as we get into chapter 5, because this will be the main theme of chapter 5, which is the importance of, uh, of this kind of communal living and, and, and sharing the things that we have and not holding anything back for ourselves. Uh, in one of the more difficult passages of the New Testament, so that'll be... Uh, That'll, that'll, be a, that'll be a topic next week when we get to chapter five. Okay, we've reached the end of chapters three and four. Thank you for your attentiveness. Are there any questions at this time? You know, we covered a lot of stuff there. Anyone, anyone? Questions, questions? All right. Well, thank you all. God bless you. Be thank well. You, Father. Next Tuesday, chapter five. Looking forward to it. All right. Thank you all. Good night.